103.8. James Warren, how are you keeping today? I'm good, thank you. Uh, good to hear. Um, okay, so Conjuring 2 is telling a true life story, which a lot of people, especially in this part of the world, would already know. Right. But on the other hand, you have to keep it entertaining and original for audiences mm-hmm. who maybe, you know, don't mm-hmm. know that much about it. Is that a hard balancing act to stay true to what actually happened while also wanting to maintain kind of original scares for the movie? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's my job as an entertainer, as a director, as a filmmaker, right? Is to uh, is to you know tell a movie that people will enjoy, you know, at the end of the day. And uh, and I tell, I keep reminding people, it's not a documentary. <laughs> However, having said that, I think um, you know a lot of the scares play stronger if they came from a place uh, of reality, right? And so, uh, so you know, so we did a lot of research. You know, we talked with Lorraine Warren, we talked with um, the Hudson family, you know, Janet, Margaret, and Billy, mm-hmm. just to give um, you know a real sense for me anyway of what they went through to try and at the very least you know capture the spirit and the emotion of what they went through um, that was important for me to be respectful to their story um, it's like I said it's a it's a subjective storytelling so um, so it's, it's about seeing the movie through their point of view and and though the Enfield case is highly documented it's been around for so long and there have been so many documentaries about this particular um, case but we've never really seen it from the point of view of the Warrens, and that's what my movie deals with. Um, a lot of horror movies I find can be very lazy when it comes to the visual aspect, and one of the one of the things I absolutely loved about the first Conjuring movie was how actually beautiful it was to look at. Mm-hmm. There's one particular shot where the girl looks under the bed and the camera swings the opposite uh-huh. way, and I was like, oh, uh-huh. that was amazing. And there's so many moments in this film as well where it was visually beautiful to look at. Uh-huh. Was that important to you to make sure that it was not just a scary film, but also kind of impressive from a kind of cinematic standpoint? Well, I think I try to do that with all my movies, regardless of the genre. You know, I try to do that in Fast and Furious 7 as well. And so I'm always trying to find things that are, that challenges myself. Uh, I'm a very visual filmmaker, and so I'm always trying to find a, an interesting new way to tell, you know, a scene that you might have seen before, but uh, but but just, you know, tell in a more unique way. I, I think that's important, uh, because as you pointed out, uh, movies are a cinematic experience, and, uh, and I want it to be as cinematic as possible. Coming off the back of Fast and Furious 7, where you had, like, pretty much all the money in the world to do whatever you wanted mm-hmm. and then come, come down to a much smaller budget of movie like this. Mm-hmm. Did that challenge you more to maybe a bit more uh, unique in the way that you film things? Um... Yeah, I actually think uh, it's kind of cooler, you know, if you're sort of um, somewhat restrained and, you know, somewhat being put out in, in a box, because then it kind of focuses you. Uh, you know, conjuring to, uh, I had a good amount of resources as well to make the movie with, and so I, I was allowed, you know, creative freedom to, to design and craft the film that I wanted to, to make. Um, but, uh, but, you know, for me, the most important thing are the human elements. Sure. So, you know, to me, the special effects is Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga and and Medicine Wolf, you know, and, and the family dynamic, and so, uh, so that's the thing that I I try not to lose sight of, mm-hmm. you know. So it's not just about the cool filmmaking toys I get to play with, it's about the people, and uh, and so uh, so we actually spend a fair bit of time crafting the script and trying to uh, get as much of the human emotion across as we could. I think it, it does a fantastic job of getting us invested in both yeah. in both families mm-hmm. uh, initially t- separately and then obviously when, when you yeah. put them together. Uh, and it, a lot of that co- does come down to the casting, especially with the young girls who would yeah. be mostly unknowns, I'd say. Yes. Uh, and they were all fantastic. There wasn't yeah. like one person who was like they stand out. They were all <laughs> brilliant. Um, but uh-huh. one of the things I was always curious about was when you're casting, I don't want to give too much away, but let's say mm-hmm. the character who has it in for Patrick Wilson. Right. Or the previous occupant of the house. When it comes to casting right. those characters, right? W- w- you know, ha- what is that like for you? you like, what do you look for? Oof. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, that is a very important casting process for me. Going back even to my con- uh, Insidious franchises, mm-hmm. right, franchise. Um, it's, uh, it's important because, uh, you know, your antagonist is so much of what ultimately, you know, helps in a, making the movie scary, right? So like, you know, so much of the film is like a big build up to showing the shark. And so you kind of want your shark to be cool, yeah. <laughs> right? Or, or at least the shark has to elicit the kind of emotional uh, 
quality that you're going for. And so uh, I do spend a lot of time going through people, trying to find just the right look. And, and because I'm so, my, my, my filmmaking tends to be very practical and very classical. And so I try not to do too much in, with visual effects and stuff like that. You know, just, just old school actors with makeup, you know, and, and how I shoot them. That's what I love. And, uh, and so, yes, that is a very important part of the process. Fantastic. James yeah. Wan, thank you so very much. Bro, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Spin 1038.